So in this lecture, we're going to talk about chemistry and specifically look at macromolecules. And so we're going to start this lecture talking about carbon and why carbon is so essential to life. So if you recall that the cell is primarily water, about 70 to 95 percent of the cell volume is composed of water and the rest is carbon-based compounds. And this would include our macromolecules, which are carbon-based compounds, which are organic molecules. And in these types of molecules, you'll see carbon bound to other carbon atoms, um, carbon bound to other elements such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. And so we'll look at the examples of our carbon-based compounds, specifically looking at our carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, such as DNA and RNA. So we're going to start by talking about why carbon is central to life. And you might recall that carbon has an atomic number of six. So if carbon has an atomic number of six, how many protons does carbon have? And recall that the number of protons is equal to the atomic number. So carbon has six protons, which are positively charged, which means how many electrons would carbon have? The answer is six. So it has two electrons in the first shell and four in the second shell. That brings us to six. How many more electrons does carbon need to fill its outer shell? And the answer is four. So carbon will need four more. So because of the fact that carbon has four valence electrons and it needs four more, carbon will make four covalent bonds. So we have one covalent bond, two covalent bonds, three and four, and that will help carbon to fill its outer shell. And so carbon has a great bonding capacity due to its structure because it's able to form a maximum of four covalent bonds. And recall, that covalent bonds are stable, and so this forms these strong, stable covalent bonds, including other carbon atoms, as well as other atoms like hydrogen and oxygen. So when we look at our hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons are gonna be made of carbon and hydrogen. And remember that carbon and hydrogen have similar electronegativities. And that's because they're both half full. So carbon has four valence electrons. It needs four more. Hydrogen has one valence electron. It needs one more. And so in terms of their electronegativities, carbon and hydrogen have similar electronegativities. And because they have similar electronegativities, recall that when they share electrons, when they form a covalent bond, they're going to share their electrons equally neither one is going to pull harder for those electrons. Remember that this will be a nonpolar covalent bond. Nonpolar, remember, think of non-pulling. Neither atom has a greater electronegativity, and therefore they share those electrons equally. Now, if these molecules are nonpolar, they are also hydrophobic. Because remember, hydrophobic means water-fearing, and in order for things to be hydrophilic, water-loving, they have to have some sort of charge, whether that be a partial charge in a polar molecule or a full charge in an ionic molecule or an, in an ion. Either way, a charge is what allows something to interact with water. If we're talking about a molecule that's nonpolar, there are no charges because those electrons are evenly distributed and so there's not gonna be one part of the molecule that's partially negative and one part that's partially positive. There's no charge overall in the molecule. And as a result, those molecules can't interact with water. And that's why these are considered to be hydrophobic. Now, when we look at hydrocarbons, they can exist in many different forms. They could be linear chains, like is the case for ethane or propane, they could be branch chains. If you look here at isobutane or 2-methylpropane, that's branched. So you have your carbon skeleton and then a carbon branching from there. You could have ring structures. So we have cyclohexane, we have benzene. These are different type of carbon-based rings. 
We could have very short chains, um, meaning two carbons long, and like in, like for ethane, or they could be several or 20s, 30s, however, um, long chains, so long hydrocarbons. Um, carbon can form single bonds, meaning it shares one pair of electrons, which is indicated by a single line. Carbon can form double bonds, which you can see here is two lines. That means it's sharing two pairs of electrons. And in some cases, carbon even exists in triple bonds, meaning that they can share three pairs of electrons. And so carbon is basically um, has a variety of different structures that can form because of its high bonding capacity. And so hydrocarbons are primary components of fats and fossil fuels. Now, because carbon can exist in many forms, different compounds with the same molecular formula can be produced. And these structures we call isomers. And so what I mean by that is I'll give you an example. If we look at ethane and propane, ethane is gonna be C2, there's two carbons. And if we count the number of hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six, it would be H6. Propane, on the other hand, is C3, H8. And so we would say that ethane and propane are not isomers. They don't have the same molecular formula. If we were saying that they were isomers, they would both be, for example, C2H6. So what I want you to do is to look at the next pair. So we have butane and we have isobutane. And I want you to think about and just look at these molecules for a moment and tell me, are these two molecules isomers? Then look at one butene and two butene. Are these two molecules isomers? Look at the ring structures, the cyclohexane and the benzene. Are those isomers? So go ahead and pause and think about your answer for a minute. And then when you're ready, go ahead and turn it back on and we'll talk about which of these pairs are isomers. So if we look at butane, butane is C4, H10. If we look at isobutane, it is also C4, H10. So knowing that is butane and isobutane, are those isomers? Yes. These are both isomers. They both have the same molecular formula. They're both C4H10, yet they are isomers because they have different structures. And so notice that carbon is able to form these isomers. We can have the same molecular formula, but slightly different structures. If we look at one butene and two butene, both of these are C4H8. C4, H8. So would we say that one butene and two butene are isomers? Answer is yes. The only difference between one butene and two butene is the position of this double bond. So in one butene, it's on the first carbon. On two butene, it's on the second carbon. And so these two molecules would be considered isomers. Now let's look at cyclohexane. Cyclohexane, notice, has C6. And if we look at the hydrogens, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And if we look at benzene, we have C6, but H6 also, because these double bonds make it so that there are less hydrogens on each carbon. Because remember, carbon forms a maximum of four bonds. So one, two, three, and four, carbon is full. This carbon, one, two, three, four, that is full. And so you'll often see these carbon-based molecules um, simplified so that when you look at this ring, like for cyclohexane, each of these points 
represents a carbon. And the reason that they can simplify this is because if you know that carbon forms four bonds, they don't need to draw the hydrogens on here because anybody knows that carbon has to have four bonds, which means that if we have carbon with this bond and this bond, it has to have two hydrogens to make its number of bonds be four. If we look at this carbon, right, we know it has one, two, and three, which means that it only has one hydrogen coming off. And so you'll often see these ring structures being simplified because you don't need to specify how many hydrogens are on there. You don't have to actually draw them out. So cyclohexane and benzene, are those isomers? And the answer is no. They both are six carbon rings, but the number of hydrogens is not equivalent. Cyclohexene has 12 hydrogens while benzene has six. So the chain of carbon atoms in an organic molecule is referred to as its carbon skeleton. And then coming off of the carbon skeleton, we can have varying what we call functional groups. So a functional group is a group of atoms that confer a special biological property on a carbon-based molecule. And these functional groups affect a bi biological molecule's function in a characteristic way. For example, if we look at ethane, ethane is going to be a two carbon molecule. Ethane is a gas. If we replace one of those hydrogens with something called a hydroxyl group, which is basically an OH group, that hydroxyl group now makes that molecule be an alcohol. And so now we've gone from ethane to ethanol, which is drinking alcohol. So by simply adding that oxygen to that carbon-based molecule, we went from ethane, which is a gas, to ethanol, which is going to be a liquid. And so this functional group, this hydroxyl group, basically gives this carbon-based molecule a characteristic property. It makes it become an alcohol. And so organic compounds have unique properties that depend on the size and the shape of the molecule and the groups of atoms or functional groups that are attached to it. So this slide is just showing you the importance of functional groups. So what you're looking at is on the left, estradiol, which is the precursor for estrogen. And on the right is testosterone. And estrogen is the female hormone and testosterone is the male hormone. And notice that they are both sterile hormones or steroid hormones, which means that they're made of four fused rings. And attached to those four fused rings have various functional groups. And so notice that they're highlighted in blue. So for testosterone, it has the CH3 group, which, what's called a methyl group. And estradiol does not have that methyl group. The other difference is going to be at this position, estradiol has a hydrogen, whereas here, instead, the oxygen is double bound to a carbon, what's called a carbonyl group. And so notice what it makes testosterone and estrogen different from one another is simply two functional groups. It's the methyl group, and then it's either a carbonyl group versus a what we call hydroxyl group. And so the only difference between essentially being male and female comes down to simply these two functional groups. So we're going to talk about some of the names of certain functional groups and the ones that you need to know. And the first is what's called a hydroxyl group. And this hydroxyl group is going to be, so the R represents a carbon skeleton. And attached to that carbon skeleton is an oxygen and a hydrogen. That, again, together is referred to as a hydroxyl group. Having hydroxyl groups on molecules 
makes those molecules an alcohol. And so some examples of molecules that um, contain these hydroxyl groups, um, certain lipids will have them, as well as carbohydrates, which are gonna be your sugars. So glucose, for example, has hydroxyl groups um, all over it. The next group, collectively, these two are referred to as a carbonyl group. And let me erase this last part here, carbonyl. And in a carbonyl group, it's going to be a carbon that's attached to a carbon skeleton. And then that carbon is double bound to an oxygen. Now, if that carbon double bound to an oxygen is at the end of a molecule, it's referred to as an aldehyde. And the way I remember that is aldehyde begins with a vowel, end begins with a vowel. So aldehydes are on the end. On the flip side, if you're looking at a carbon double bound to oxygen, that's in the middle, not at the end, but in the middle of a carbon skeleton, we call that a ketone. So think of K and M, ketones are in the middle. And so these carbonyl groups are used, for example, in sugars like glucose, um, fructose has uh, carbonyl groups, etc. The next functional group is what we call a methyl group. And a methyl group is a CH3 group. It's a carbon bound to three hydrogens. And methyl groups are used in DNA. So it's used to mark DNA and it affects what we call gene expression, which we'll talk about later on in the semester. Um, it's also important for energy metabolism. Next, we have our amino groups. And our amino groups is gonna be a nitrogen bound to two hydrogens. And so amino groups are gonna be important for proteins, for example. We are gonna learn that the building blocks of proteins are referred to as amino acids. So the building blocks are amino acids. The reason they're called amino acids, the amino part comes from the fact that that building block has an amino functional group. These two, the ester and the ether, you don't need to know these for the exam. Um, an ester linkage is gonna be found in the cell membrane or the plasma membrane of bacterial and eukaryotic cells. Ether-linked lipids are gonna be found in archaeal plasma membranes. And so that's a difference in terms of their function um, for where they're found. Sulfhydryl groups, which is going to be a sulfur bound to a hydrogen, uh, that you do need to know. And what we're going to learn in the class is that these sulfhydryl groups serve several purposes. One is they're used for energy metabolism, meaning that they can be used as a source of sulfur um, as well as a source of energy. Sulfhydryl groups are also important for protein structure because what we're gonna learn is that proteins only function if they're in their correct conformation. And in order for proteins to be in their correct conformation or shape, the protein or the amino acids need to interact with one another. The amino acid can interact using hydrogen bonding, um, ionic bonding, covalent bonding, etc. And if it's gonna interact using covalent bonding between amino acids, it's gonna link through so these sulfhydryl groups, meaning these two sulfhydryl groups can link together and it can form a covalent bond. And that covalent bond is very strong and sturdy and helps give protein strength and structure. The next group that we're gonna talk about is gonna be the carboxyl group. And the carboxyl group is gonna be a C double bound O and this carbon is also bound to another oxygen. And so that's the difference between a carboxyl and a carbonyl group. Carboxyl group is a carbon bound to two oxygens. Now, the interesting things about these carboxyl groups is that this oxygen um, and carbon form a double bond. And what can happen is that this double bond does something called resonates, meaning the electron can come 
And now the carbon can be sharing the electrons with this oxygen. And so when this electron is being shared here, what that does is that causes hydrogen to leave. Because oxygen, remember, can only form two bonds. So if the electron is shared over between this carbon and this oxygen, that will cause that um, hydrogen to leave. And therefore, these carboxyl groups act as acids, meaning that they will add or donate hydrogens to the solution. Because when that double bond resonates, it's going to kick off that hydrogen. It's going to increase the hydrogen ion concentration of the solution. And so this is going to be found in organic acids. Um, you'll find these in lipids. Uh, proteins also have carboxyl groups. Um, for example, again, the building blocks of proteins are referred to as amino acids. Amino comes from the fact that it has that amino functional group. Acids come from the fact that it has this carboxyl group, which acts as an acid. And that's why they're called amino acids. The last functional group that we need to know is going to be our phosphate group. And our phosphate group is going to be a phosphorus bound to four oxygen. And so notice that these phosphate groups give molecules um, a, a net negative charge. And so where you're going to see phosphate groups um, would be nucleic acids like um, adenosine triphosphate, so ATP, which is used for energy. We have phosphates in DNA, for example, um, as well as lipids. Lipids are made up of, um, or a type of lipid is going to be a phospholipid. And a phospholipid is the primary component of the cell membrane. And remember that cells have a overall negative charge. And remember, that's why they stain with a basic stain, which is positively charged. And so that negative charge partly comes from having these phosphate groups on the phospholipids on the cell membrane. So what I want you to do now is to test your knowledge and see if you can identify the functional groups in an amino acid. And so in an amino acid, we have the central carbon bound to a hydrogen, bound to an R group, which is the variable part of the amino acid. And so what I want you to do is to identify this region in the blue and this region that's kind of this reddish pink color. And so go ahead and identify those. Pause the video while you try and work on this. And when you're ready, go ahead and turn it back on. So if you said that the blue is an amino group and the red is a carboxyl group, then you would be correct. And again, it's because this is the amino and the acid comes from the fact that this carboxyl group can donate hydrogens to the solution and therefore act as an acid. So question for you, carbon is such an important molecule for life because red, it can be bonded ionically, yellow, it cannot form isomers, green, it can form chemical bonds with a maximum of four other atoms, blue, it can hydrogen bond to so many molecules, purple, it's part of the water molecule. So go ahead and pause, think about your answer, and when you're ready, go ahead and turn back on your video to hear the correct answer. So if you said green, then you're correct. It can form chemical bonds with a maximum of four other atoms. So remember that carbon has four valence electrons. It needs four more to fill its outer shell and therefore will form four covalent bonds. It's not red, it can be bonded ionically because remember that an ion has a different number of electrons. Now, in order for carbon to be an ion, remember that carbon has four valence electrons. So to fill its outer shell, carbon would either need to donate all four electrons or receive four electrons. And that's not likely to happen, right? Carbon is not highly electronegative, therefore will not be able to attract four electrons or steal four electrons from other atoms. 
So carbon is not typically going to form ionic bonds. Yellow, it cannot form isomers. That's not true, right? We saw examples of isomers, butane, isobutane, one butene, two butene. Those are both examples of isomers. They have the same molecular formula, but slightly different structures. So it's not yellow. Blue says it can hydrogen bond to so many molecules. That is not true. Remember that the definition of a hydrogen bond is an already covalently linked hydrogen to an electronegative atom. Carbon is not an electronegative atom. It has very little electronegativity and therefore it doesn't form hydrogen bonds. Purple, it's part of the water molecule. That is not true, right? Water is simply H2O, which is two hydrogens and an oxygen. So now we're gonna go through and talk about our carbon-based macromolecules. So what are macromolecules? These are simply large molecules that are important for life. And so of the four classes of macromolecules, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids all exist as what we call polymers. Poly means many, meaning it's many repeating subunits linked together by covalent bonds. And so notice it says chains of simple monomers. Mono means one, so it's one subunit that's linked together by a covalent bond. And so these three macromolecules have a single type of subunit, and the subunit repeats over and over again, and you get these polymers. Lipids, on the other hand, which is our fourth class of macromolecule, do not exist as polymers. They don't have one repeating subunit. These lipids are built from two or more different types of smaller subunits. So for example, you're gonna see when we look at lipids, we have our steroids, for example, we have our triglycerides. Structurally, they're very different. There's not one repeating subunit that's found in lipids. So again, monomer, mono means one. It's a sil single building block that can be linked up to form a polymer, and poly means many. So it's many repeating subunits, um, similar types at least, um, linked together. And polymers can be thousands of monomers long. So an example of a monomer would be a monosaccharide. Mono means one. Saccharide is sugar. It's one simple sugar. So for example, glucose. Glucose would be an example of a monomer. The polymer of glucose is called a polysaccharide, meaning many sugars linked together. And an example of a polysaccharide would be starch. So whenever we're building our polymers, we are going to use a dehydration reaction. Think about if you become dehydrated. What has happened? That means that you've lost water, right? Water was removed. And so in a dehydration reaction, that means that we start with this growing chain or this short polymer and a monomer that we're trying to link on to this polymer. And so what's gonna happen is, is that what's, what you're gonna see is that we need to remove water in order to form the covalent bond between that growing polymer and that unlinked monomer. And so water's gonna be removed, and now we're gonna form a bond between those two molecules. And so now my polymer has grown by one additional monomer. And so this will remove water to form these polymers. Now, I want you to think for a minute, what do you think would have to happen if we want to break that bond, right? So if we had to remove water to form that bond, what do you think has to happen in order for that bond to be broken? And if you said that water would need to be added back, you would be correct. 
And so water gets added back to break that bond. And that's referred to as hydrolysis. Hydro, water, lysis, breaking. So hydrolysis is using water to break that bond. And so we've looked at several hydrolysis reactions so far in lab, right? We looked at starch hydrolysis, for example. And that is we were looking at the breakdown of starch, removing glucose from that molecule of starch. And so that's hydrolysis. We have to put in water in order to break that bond. And so building polymers, dehydration, breaking them down is going to be hydrolysis. So if we look at examples of monomers and polymers, the first class of macromolecule will be the carbohydrate. And when looking at a carbohydrate, the type or the name of the, of the monomer is going to be a monosaccharide. Mono means one. Saccharide is sugar. It's one sugar. An example would be glucose or fructose. Now be careful. If I ask you the name of the monomer for carbohydrates, you're not going to say the name of the monomer is glucose. Glucose is an example, but the name of the monomer for a carbohydrate is going to be a monosaccharide. The polymer of a carbohydrate is referred to as a polysaccharide. It's many sugars linked together. And we will talk about some examples. We'll look at starch and glycogen and cellulose, etc. cetera. Um, those are examples of polysaccharides. If we're talking about our macromolecules being proteins, our monomer is gonna be our amino acid. That's the building block of proteins. Examples, arginine, leucine. In lab, we looked at tryptophan for our indole test, right? Those are amino acids. The polymer is referred to as either a polypeptide or a protein. Now, polypeptide, that's many amino acids linked together. The difference between a polypeptide and a protein is a protein is more of the three-dimensional structure at the end, meaning that a protein might be made of multiple polypeptide chains. For example, hemoglobin is a type of protein. Hemoglobin is made of four separate polypeptide chains, two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. And so it's four polypeptide chains put together to form the functional protein. And so if I were to ask you what the polymer is for a protein, you would be correct if you said either a polypeptide or a protein. Lastly, we have our nucleic acids. And our monomer for nucleic acids would be our nucleotide. And a nucleotide is made of three parts, a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. If we link nucleotides together, the polymer that we're going to get is going to be a nucleic acid. And so an example of a nucleic acid um, would be DNA or RNA. Now notice we're missing a class of macromolecule on this list. You might notice that we don't have lipids here on this table. And recall back to what we talked about, why wouldn't we see lipids on this table? And the answer is that lipids don't have monomers and polymers. There's not one repeating subunit that's linked together to make up a polymer for lipids. So a polymer is red, a small molecule such as glucose, yellow, an element that forms two or more bonds, green, an animal that eats more than one type of food, blue, large molecule made of many similar subunits, purple, large molecule made up of different types of subunits.
So go ahead and pause, think about your answer. And when you're ready, go ahead and turn the video back on to hear the correct answer. So if you said blue, you would be correct. It's large molecule made of many similar subunits. Now notice that I was careful not to use same. And the reason is, is that they will be of the same type, but they don't necessarily have to be exactly the same. What I mean by that is if we look at our protein, which is our polymer, proteins are amino acids that are linked together. It could be leucine linked with arginine, linked with methionine, glycine, alanine, etc. They're all amino acids, but they're not necessarily the same amino acid. And so that's why I was careful not to say the same, but similar subunits. They're the same type, but they might not be identical. Purple's not true because it says a large molecule made of different types of subunits. That's not true. They're not different types. They're similar types. So it's not different types, it's similar types um, linked together. So we're going to look at now our types of macromolecules. And the first one we'll talk about will be our carbohydrates. So the first macromolecule would be our carbohydrates. And the main function of carbohydrates is that they're used for cell structure. For example, um, cellulose makes up the cell wall of plants. That means that this carbohydrate is used for the structure in the cell. Carbohydrates are also a primary energy source, meaning that organism, organisms use them as a food source. The atoms that you will find in a carbohydrate will be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen with the formula CH2ON, referring to uh, like the number of carbons. So let's say we're talking about a six carbon sugar it would have a molecular formula of C6H12O6. So there would be twice as many hydrogens as there would be for carbon or oxygen. Um, the monomers of a carbohydrate are referred to as a monosaccharide. And so these are simple sugars with um, lengths of between three to seven carbons. Now, when you think of carbohydrates, probably the most common things that come to mind would be really starchy foods, bread, pasta, crackers, etc. But it's important to note that um, these are not the only foods that contain carbohydrates. Milk has a carbohydrate. It has lactose in it. Fruit has carbohydrates in it, it has fructose in it, etc. So while these are examples of foods that are rich in carbohydrates, these are not the only examples. So our building blocks of our sugars are referred to as our monosaccharides. And so again, these are gonna be our simple sugars. These cannot be broken down into smaller sugars. They simply are the smallest subunit. And monosaccharides serve as the main fuel molecule for cellular work. Meaning, glucose, for example, is a primary energy source for most cells. Fructose, on the other hand, fructose would be fruit sugar. So bananas, oranges, apples would all contain fructose, which is a monosaccharide. Disaccharide, di means two. This is a double sugar, meaning that it's two linked monosaccharides. It could be sucrose, which is table sugar. That is glucose and fructose linked together. It could be lactose, which is milk sugar. Um, that's uh, glucose and galactose linked together. It could be maltose, which is two um, glucose molecules linked together etc, etc. So you get different disaccharides depending on which monosaccharides you link together. 
So as an example to show you the difference between our monosaccharides, so notice that the picture on the left, we have glucose. Glucose is C6H12O6. On the right, we have fructose, which is C6H12O6. And so these two molecules are isomers. They have the same molecular formula, yet structurally they're different. If we look at fructose, fructose has the carbonyl group in the middle, which makes it a ketone. Glucose, on the other hand, has that functional group, that carbonyl group at the end, which makes it an aldehyde. And so simply by switching the position of that carbonyl group, excuse me, it affects the function of that molecule. Fructose is a lot sweeter, considerably sweeter than glucose. If you've ever had to take a glucose tolerance test, for example, to test for diabetes, etc., um, you'll know that drinking that glucose solution doesn't taste good. It's not what you think of as like a sugary drink. It has a very different taste. And so even though glucose and fructose have the same molecular formula, structurally they're different, which makes them behave in very different ways. So if we are going to link our um, monosaccharides together, we need to do a, di a dehydration reaction. And so remember that to link or to form polymers, we need dehydration reactions. So we are going to remove a molecule of water in order to covalently link those two sugars together. And so the type of bond that forms as a result is referred to as a glycosidic linkage, glyco referring to sugar. So this is going to form a glycosidic linkage that will join glucose plus galactose together. And that now is going to be our disaccharide. And so again, lactose would be our milk sugar. So our polymer of carbohydrates are referred to as a polysaccharide, meaning many sugars linked together. And these are also referred to as our complex carbohydrates. There are four different polysaccharides that are critical in the living world. Starch and glycogen, these are both storage polysaccharide, meaning that this is how organisms store their sugar for energy. Cellulose and chitin are both structural. They are used to give organisms cells um, structure and strength. And so that's different than starch and glycogen, which is used for energy. So starch is the nutrient storage form of carbohydrates in plants. This is how plants store their sugar. For example, plants would store sugar so that during the, during the winter, when sunlight is not available and the plant can't continue to do photosynthesis, instead of making more sugar, it's going to utilize its stored sugar um, in order to still have a food source, even when sunlight is not available. So an example of places where you might find starch, um, seeds, for example, rice, wheat grains, these are all places where starch would be stored. Um, in the roots of certain plants, so carrots and beets would store, um, would store starch in the roots, potatoes, etc. Glycogen is the nutrient storage form of carbohydrates in animals. This is how animals store their sugar. We don't store it as, um, we don't store it as starch, instead we store it as glycogen. And for animals, glycogen is stored in two tissues primarily. It's used or stored in muscles or liver cells. And when the, when the body requires glucose, let's say, for example, you haven't eaten for a while. Your cells still need glucose in order to do cellular respiration and to make ATP.
And so in that case, um, if you haven't eaten in a while and your cells are utilizing your blood sugar, now your blood sugar will begin to drop. So your blood sugar levels will drop and your cells still need sugar for energy. And so what the body's gonna do is now it's gonna break down that stored sugar. It's going to break down the glycogen in the liver or the muscle. And it's gonna take that, that glycogen and break it down and release glucose. And that will help blood glucose levels to go back up. And so basically glycogen is stored sugar for animals. Cellulose, remember, is a structural carbohydrate. It's a rigid structural carbohydrate found in the cell walls of many organisms, for example, plants or algae. This is the most abundant organic compound on earth. Trees, cotton, leaves, cellulose, or grasses are made largely of cellulose. Now, humans and other mammals can't digest cellulose meaning that we can't break it down to use that sugar as energy. However, in the gut of certain animals, like cows, for example, they will have symbionts or these organisms like bacteria that work together with the cow and will help them to digest the cellulose in the grass that they eat, for example. Now, cellulose or our, is a type of complex carbohydrate. And although we can't break it down for food, meaning for energy, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't eat foods that have cellulose in them. Because while cellulose is not used for energy per se, it's a major source of insoluble fiber, meaning that our bodies don't break it down and it helps us to feel full longer, which helps us to not overeat. It also helps us to move our food through our digestive tract um, because as gross as it sounds, one of the things that happens when we eat fiber is that the gut will start to produce a mucousy substance and that mucus that is produced will help to move the food through the digestive tract. And so if you've ever heard of somebody being constipated, um, a doctor will say, you know, you should try eating a high fiber diet, right? Because that fiber is going to help to basically stimulate that mucus, which will help to move food through the digestive tract. Our last complex carbohydrate is going to be chitin. And this is a tough carbohydrate that forms the external skeleton of arthropods. It's also found in the cell walls of fungi. And again, our bodies or our cells can't digest chitin, uh, but chitin is used to give shape and strength to the structure of the organism. And so we're gonna move on now to talk about our lipids. So lipids, there are three general classes. We have our triglycerides, um, our triglycerides are otherwise known as our fats. We have our phospholipids, which will be our membrane lipids. We have our sterols, which you can see in the bottom left here. Uh, these are going to be our cholesterols and our steroid hormones like estrogen, um, testosterone, etc. They're made of four fused rings. But notice that if you look at the sterol, and compare it, excuse me, with the fat, and you compare that with the phospholipid, that structurally they're very, very different, right? They don't have one repeating subunits. And remember we said that lipids don't have these monomers and polymers. But what you will notice is that one of the things that happens in lipids is they are primarily hydrocarbons, meaning they're made primarily of carbon and hydrogen, not only carbon and hydrogen, but mostly. Now, if you recall, carbon and hydrogen have similar electronegativities, 
right? So carbon and hydrogen have similar electronegativities, which means that when they share electrons, will they share equally or unequally? And the answer is that they will share equally, right? Neither one is going to pull harder for those electrons. So as a result, because they're sharing equally, will that be polar or nonpolar? And the answer is nonpolar which remember, think of non-pulling. Neither atom is pulling harder for those electrons. And as a result, if the electrons are shared equally and they're non-polar, do we end up with a charge on these hydrocarbons? And the answer is no, there's no charge. So would that then be hydrophobic or hydrophilic? So if you said hydrophobic, you would be correct. They would be water fearing, meaning they don't interact with water because there's no charge on that lipid in order for it to interact with the water. And so this is why, for example, oil and water don't mix because it's largely hydrophobic. It's primarily hydrocarbon Carbon and hydrogen, similar electronegativities. Because of their similar electronegativities, they're going to share electrons equally, which means that they're going to be nonpolar. When they're nonpolar, they're not going to have a charge, and therefore they will be hydrophobic. And so, what makes something classified as a lipid is that it's primarily hydrocarbons, it's nonpolar, and it's hydrophobic. Otherwise, in terms of structure, they're very different. So a triglyceride, tri means three. It's one glycerol, which is a three carbon sugar. So this is our three carbon sugar with our hydroxyl groups on it. We are gonna link this one glycerol to three fatty acid chains. And so these fatty acids uh, basically are going to be these largely hydrocarbon groups with a carboxyl group on them. And so to form our triglyceride, we are going to do a dehydration reaction. Because remember that for any time we're building something, we're going to use dehydration and we're going to remove water. So we're going to remove a water here, a water molecule here, another one here, and the type of bond that's going to form between them is going to be called an ester linkage. And so the ester linkage is going to be linking the glycerol with the fatty acid chains. When we look at those fatty acid chains, the fatty acid chains could be the same, meaning it could be that they are made of all palmitic acid, for example, or it's possible that the fatty acid chains on the triglyceride are different. So it could be partly one type and then partly another, etc. And so those fatty acid chains can vary. So when we look at our triglycerides, our fatty acid chains can be saturated fats. And what that means is that when we say that a fat is a saturated fat, Recall that when you see these little points, these represent carbons, and that we don't see the hydrogens on there because we know that depending on how many, um, how many bonds carbon can form, right, carbon forms four, that we know how many hydrogens will be coming off of it. And so if we look at a hydrocarbon chain, which is many carbons linked together, we know that, so here's the rest, here's our hydrogen, and our hydrogen, et cetera. And then this last carbon has three hydrogens to form its four bonds. And so if we say that a fatty acid is saturated, it means that it's saturated with hydrogens. It has the most number of hydrogens that it can possibly have. And that happens when carbon forms all single bonds between the carbon atoms. Notice what happens if I add a double bond here. 
So if that double bond is there, right, remember that carbon only forms four bonds. So one, two, three, four. This hydrogen goes away. This hydrogen goes away. So when we add a double bond, it's no longer saturated with hydrogens. It's missing some of those hydrogens, and therefore we would then call that an unsaturated fat. So the difference between a saturated fat and an unsaturated, a saturated fat has all carbon single bonds, and therefore is gonna be saturated with their hydrogens. When this happens, carbon forms these straight linear molecules, meaning that there's no kinks or bends in this hydrocarbon chain. And so as a result, you can imagine that if these fatty acid chains represent papers, like if you had a stack of papers that are all flat, they would stack tightly on top of one another. And therefore, because they could pack in tightly, saturated fats are typically solid at room temperature. And so they're solid because these fatty acids can, can stack very tightly and therefore they're more likely to be solid at room temperature. Saturated fats are more commonly associated with fats coming from animal products, um, etc. Unsaturated fats, remember, are when we have our double bond. And therefore, the molecule is not saturated. Whoops, let's not put that one there. The molecule is not saturated with the hydrogens anymore because when we have a double bond, that basically makes it so that hydrogen has to be removed because carbon can only form a maximum of four bonds. And so if you've ever heard of a monounsaturated fat, what that simply means is that that fat has one double bond. A polyunsaturated fat, on the other hand, has more than one double bond, two, three, etc. And so our unsaturated fats have at least one carbon-carbon double bond. The molecule is not saturated with hydrogens. And what ends up happening is, is wherever that double bond is, that can cause a kink in the molecule. So now you can imagine that if you don't have flat papers, but instead you have one paper that's folded into, let's say, like a V-like structure, and you try to stack those on top of each other, they're not going to lay as flat because of that kink, right? There's going to be a gap, and the density is going to be lower, meaning that for unsaturated fats that have a kink, they're not going to pack in as tightly. And because they don't pack in as tightly, these types of fats are more likely to be liquid at room temperature. And so these are fats usually more commonly associated with plants or fish, etc. These would be more likely to be unsaturated fats. So what is the function of our fats? Um, fats are used as an energy storage. Um, a gram of fat stores twice as much ener energy as a gram of polysaccharide, meaning that they actually store more sugar, or I'm sorry, they store more energy compared to sugar. And fats are stored in specialized cells called adipose cells in adipose tissue. And so this specialized tissue in the body is used to help store fat. Fats are also used to cushion vital organs, such as the kidney. Fats are used to help insulate the body. Um, a layer of fat is found underneath the skin in something called the hypodermis, and that helps to keep the body warm. Our next type of, of um, lipid is going to be our phospholipid, and our phospholipid is going to be one, glycerol, which remember is a three carbon sugar, two fatty acid chains, one phosphate group and one variable alcohol group. And so what you can see is that if you look at that phosphate group, that phosphate group is charged. Fatty acid chains are primarily hydrocarbons. Those are gonna be nonpolar. So you end up with this polar head, meaning that this one part of the molecule that has a charge and wants to interact with water, 
and the nonpolar tails or the or the hydrophobic tails. So you'll hear this referred to as the hydrophilic head. It's water loving. It has charges that want to interact with water and the hydrophobic tails, which are water fearing and don't want to interact with water. So phospholipids are what we call amphipathic. One end is going to be polar, right? Interacts with water. That's the head. And the other end is nonpolar and won't interact with water. And that's going to be our fatty acid tail. And so because of this dual nature of a phospholipid, phospholipids orient themselves in very characteristic ways. They will orient themselves so that the hydrophilic head faces outside the cell where water is found. And the hydrophilic head faces the cytoplasm, which remember is also primarily water. So the hydrophilic heads will face where water is located, both outside or inside the cell. The hydrophobic tails, right, they're water fearing. They want to be shielded from the water. And so the tails are going to be the middle of the phospholipid bilayer, meaning it's going to be shielded from the water. And so what you get is you get this phospholipid bilayer. The heads face outside and inside and the tails are in the middle. You can think of the heads as like the sandwich, uh, the bread of the sandwich, and then the tails are like the meat. It's the stuff in the middle. And so the reason that phospholipids orient themselves the way that they do is so that that hydrophilic head faces the water and the hydrophobic tails are in the middle, shielded from the water. Our last type of lipid is going to be our steroid. This is going to be a carbon skeleton with our four fused rings and varying functional groups. An example of a steroid would be cholesterol. And cholesterol serves a variety of purposes. One, it's found in the membrane of certain organisms like animals. Um, and it's used to help maintain the correct fluidity of the membrane, meaning to make it so that the membrane is not too solid or not too liquid, but the correct viscosity. The other purpose of cholesterol is that it actually serves as a precursor for all other steroids like testosterone and estrogen, meaning that the body actually converts cholesterol into testosterone or estrogen. And so when you think of cholesterol, you don't want to always think of cholesterol as being bad. Cholesterol actually does have a very important use, but it's too much cholesterol that has a negative outcome. So question for you. A newly discovered lipid extracted from a rare Polynesian plant is solid at room temperature. This is more likely to be red, a saturated fat, yellow, an unsaturated fat, green, a phospholipid, or blue, none of the above. So go ahead and take a minute, pause your video, and when you're ready, go ahead and turn it back on and get the answer. So go ahead. So if you said red, a saturated fat, you would be correct because a saturated fat, remember, has no double bonds. No double bonds means that it is going to uh, form linear molecules. And those linear molecules are going to stack on top of one another much better and therefore are more likely to be solid at room temperature. The next group of macromolecules that we're going to look at will be our proteins. Proteins serve a variety of functions um, in organisms. Uh, the first thing that proteins can be used for is that they can serve a structural role, uh, meaning that they can be used to provide support. For example, could be used to give hair or horns their toughness, or in the case of humans, right, keratin in our skin is used as a structural protein. It, it is a very, a very hardy protein. It acts as a good barrier to keep bacteria out and keep water in, right? Bacteria, certain bacteria, also produce a structure called an endospore. And the endospore is also made of keratin, 
and that endospore is to protect the bacteria during adverse conditions. Some proteins serve as storage proteins, meaning that they are used to provide amino acids for growth. Seeds, eggs, for example, are rich in storage proteins. Eggs have a protein called albumin in them, and that's used to supply the growing embryo with the energy that it needs in order to grow and develop. Because you have to think about, right, if it's an egg, animals will lay the egg and the mother is no longer providing that food source. They have to have stored food in order for development to occur. We also have contractile proteins, which are used to help with movement. For example, muscles have a type of protein called actin in, or I'm sorry, they have a type of protein called myosin in them. And myosin is a motor protein that interacts with actin. And myosin walks along the actin like little feet. And it's going to contract and it's going to pull the muscle for muscle contraction. Proteins can also be used as transport proteins. They're used to help move other molecules. For example, in red blood cells, red blood cells have a protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that will bind to oxygen and will transport oxygen throughout the body. So when the red blood cells circulate to the lungs, they'll pick up oxygen. And then when the red blood cells move through the circulatory system, they'll drop ox oxygen off at the various tissues. And so hemoglobin would be a transport protein. And then lastly, we have proteins that can act as enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that help speed up chemical reactions. Um, and so we've talked about a variety of enzymes in lab that help speed up different chemical reactions. So proteins are the polymers. And again, the name of the monomers are called amino acids. And amino acids are going to be our building blocks for our proteins. Remember that our polymer can either be called a protein or a polypeptide. The difference being polypeptide is just the chain of amino acids. Proteins can be multiple polypeptide chains put together. In terms of the atoms that you're going to find in proteins, you're going to find carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur in certain amino acids. Now, our amino acids are building blocks. There are 20 different naturally occurring amino acids. And what, what you can see if you look at the structure of the amino acid, we have this alpha carbon. So this is the central carbon. We have an amino group and a carboxyl group. And again, that carboxyl group adds as an acid, acts as an acid, meaning that it can donate hydrogens to the solution, which is why we call this an amino acid. Now, attached to this alpha carbon, we also have this hydrogen. And then the part that makes the amino acids different is going to be this R group. So the R group is the variable part of the amino acid. That's the part that's different in the 20 different amino acids. And so each R group has a specific shape and chemical property. For example, uh, glycine would have its R group would be a hydrogen. Alanine would be a methyl group. It would be a CH3. If we look down here, we have leucine. So notice the yellow represents the R group. Leucine is primarily hydrocarbons. Or we could have serine, which has a hydroxyl group at the end. And so these R groups come in three basic flavors or three basic categories. We can have R groups that are nonpolar or hydrophobic, like leucine. Because again, leucine is primarily hydrocarbons carbon and hydrogen, similar electronegativities, therefore they share electrons equally. Again, that means they're nonpolar, they're also hydrophobic. We could have our groups that are polar, right, or hydrophilic, they will interact with water. Serine would be a hydrophilic amino acid, 
because that hydroxyl group, that OH group, is going to be polar. And it's polar because oxygen and hydrogen have different electronegativities. And so oxygen and hydrogen will not share equally. Oxygen has a greater electronegativity, therefore will pull harder for those electrons. Oxygen will become partially negative. Hydrogen becomes partially positive. Now it's polar and it's hydrophilic. Other R groups can be charged or ionized, meaning that if, let's say, you had a carboxyl group at the end of the R group, that can become ionic when it donates its hydrogens to the solution and you're left with an O minus on one of the oxygens. And so these R groups have three basic types, nonpolar, polar, or charged. And depending on what R groups you have, will dictate how the protein functions. So to build the polymer of proteins, remember that the polymer is also called a polypeptide or a protein. And just like building any other macromolecule, in order to build the macromolecule, it's going to be a dehydration reaction. So to form that covalent bond between the monomers, we have to remove a water molecule. And so where does that water molecule come from? Well, it comes from one amino acid's carboxyl group and an adjacent amino acid's amino group. And so we're going to link that carboxyl group with the amino group. And when we do this, we're going to remove a water molecule. And what's going to form is going to be a peptide bond. And so a peptide bond is a covalent bond that links the amino groups or amino acids together. So instead of it being a carboxyl group, it's now a carbonyl group, but we have this peptide bond formed between the amino acids. So what we end up with is we end up with this polymer that has two distinct ends. One group is referred to as the N-terminus, the N-terminus meaning it's the free amino group. Notice this amino group, is free, but this one is not, and this one is not, because it's participating in this peptide bond. So we have our free amino end here, and on this end, we have the C-terminus, otherwise known as the carboxyl end, because that's the free carboxyl group. This carboxyl group is in the peptide bond, that carboxyl group is in the peptide bond, and so we have one free C-terminus, one free N-terminus, and so proteins have two distinct ends, an N-terminus and a C-terminus. And proteins can be several thousand amino acids long. So these can be these very long polymers of amino acids linked together. Now, in terms of um, amino acids, Amino acids exist in either of two what we call stereoisomers, meaning that structurally they look the same, except they're mirror images of one another. And so you can imagine this like your right and your left hand, while very similar, they, if you were to lay them on top of one another, they don't line up perfectly because they're mirror images of one another. Amino acids are the same way. They have what's called an L-amino acid or a D-amino acid. The L-amino acid is the one that's found most commonly in nature. It's the most more common of the two. You'll learn later that the D-amino acid, um, for example, um, in a capsule, uh, Bacillus anthracis uses D-glutamic acid. And as a result, because the immune system doesn't recognize that D amino acid, it doesn't know how to break it down. And as a result, Bacillus anthracis, its capsule, is resistant to phagocytic digestion, meaning the body can't break it down um, because it's this um, isomer of glutamic acid that the body doesn't recognize. Proteins only function if they're in their correct conformation, which is their correct shape. And 
Linear chains of amino acids fold in very characteristic ways, and it's dependent on the sequence of the amino acids. So if we look, and we look at on the left here, we have our influenza virus, and on the right is a protein called an antibody. And antibodies have these Y shapes, and the antibody has this region that notice is complementary to these, this influenza virus. And so it's the shape of this antibody that allows it to recognize this influenza virus. And if that shape is changed, the antibody wouldn't work in the right way. And so confirmation or folding and the shape of the protein plays a really big role. Um, in the purple, we see lysozyme, which is an enzyme found in tear and saliva. It's used as a protection against bacteria because it breaks down um, peptidoglycan in bacterial cell walls. And enzymes are typically more globular proteins because they have these grooves, what we call an active site, where a particular substrate comes in and the enzyme does that chemical reaction. On the right, we have collagen, and collagen is a structural protein. And notice that collagen is made of three intertwining polypeptide chains. And this particular conformation makes this be a, a good structural protein because it has structure and strength. And so we're going to look at the four levels of protein structure, what we call primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Quaternary exists in proteins that have more than one polypeptide chain. And so we're going to talk about each type of protein structure. Primary sequence is going to be simply the sequence of amino acids along the chain. So talking about the sequence from the end terminus, because remember that proteins have two distinct ends, an N terminus and a C terminus. So the primary sequence would be what is the sequence of the amino acids going from the N terminus to the C terminus. So we have in this example glycine, threonine, glycine, glutamic acid, serine, lysine, cysteine, proline, etc. Those amino acids in order would be the primary sequence of the protein. And the correct sequence of amino acids is determined by the cell's genetic information, meaning it's the cell's DNA that's going to tell the cell what amino acid sequence to, to link together. And so later on in the semester, we'll talk about how DNA codes for protein. But it's the cell's genetic information that will tell the cell what amino acids to put in what order. Secondary structure now is not simply the sequence of the amino acids, but now it's the folding, the beginning of the folding of the protein. And so when we look at secondary structure, there are two main types, what's called an alpha helices. And an alpha helices is going to be a helical shape. Think of old telephone cords, which have the coils coming down, or they could have beta pleated sheets. Beta pleated sheets are kind of an accordion-like structure where it folds back and forth. And so both of those structures, though, are dependent on hydrogen bonding between the backbone of the protein sequence, meaning that it's not the R groups that are interacting. It's those carbonyl groups with the amino groups that are in the peptide bonds. It's those those parts of the amino acid that are interacting. So this is going to be an interaction among the backbone of the protein versus an interaction among the R groups. And so this is basically just coiling and pleating of the chain held together by hydrogen bonds within the backbone. That's, due, that's different than tertiary structure or third level of structure which is now going to be this irregular folding, and this is going to be determined by the R groups, meaning it's the R groups that are now going to interact with one another. It's not the backbone of the protein, 
but instead it's the R groups. And there are several types of interactions that can happen. Uh, we can get hydrophobic interactions between two R groups that are both hydrophobic. We could get hydrogen bonding between um, two R groups. We can get an ionic bond between a positively charged R group and a negatively charged R group. We can even get a disulfide bridge, which is going to be a covalent bond between um, adjacent sulfur, what are called sulfhydryl groups, um, found on cysteine amino acids. And so when we look at this, if you think about these types of interactions, so hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and you think about that certain bacteria live in, let's say, very hot environments, for example, you want to think about that one of the things that allows certain organisms to live in different environments is that they have certain adaptations that allow them to survive and to thrive in those types of conditions. And so if you think of bacteria that live in hot environments, for example, they have to have adaptations to their protein sequences or their protein structures that allows them to survive at high temperatures. Because remember in lab, when we talked about heat fixing, right? So when we make our slides and we do a heat fixing step, we said that the reason that heat fixing works is that because when you heat something up, molecular motion increases and molecular motion increases until proteins start to denature. So what that tells you is that bacteria that live in hot environments must have some types of adaptations that help protect against their proteins denaturing at higher temperatures. And so if you think about the types of interactions found in tertiary structure, one of the reasons certain bacteria can live in high temperatures is because their proteins have more of one type of bond than another. So if you think about these interactions, which of the type of bonds would be the strongest? And the answer would be the covalent bond. And so that cysteine um, amino acid, which forms the disulfide bridge for organisms that live in high temperatures, their proteins are adapted to have more cysteine amino acids to form more disulfide bridges because that covalent bond is stronger, which helps resist the proteins denaturing. And lastly, we have our quaternary structure. Um, this is not found in all proteins. It's only found in proteins that are made of more than one polypeptide chain. So quaternary structure will be the interactions between two or more different or two or more polypeptide chains. And these types of proteins we call oligomers. They're made of multiple subunits. And so you can have multiple polypeptides forming these large multi-unit proteins. So for example, in the case of hemoglobin, hemoglobin is made of four polypeptide chains. That would be its quaternary structure. It has two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. And so it's four polypeptide chains linked together. Therefore, that would be the quaternary structure. Now, remember that proteins only function if they're in their correct conformation. And their correct conformation is referred to as their native conformation. This is the proper shape of the functioning protein. However, proteins can become denatured, and that is when the protein becomes unraveled or unfolded, and this um, causes this protein to lose its function because, again, it only functions if it's in its correct conformation. There are several things that can cause proteins to denature. Temperature is one that we've already talked about, right, because if we heat something up, we increase molecular motion, which can break the bonds between the um, R groups, for example, and can cause proteins to unfold. Uh, salt concentrations can also affect protein structure because you can think about those R groups. You can have ionic interactions between those R groups. If you add salt into the solution or into the cell, that can affect the way that the protein interacts with the salt in the solution, 
versus interacting within the protein itself. And so if the protein begins to interact with the salt in the solution versus interacting with other R groups, it can cause the protein to denature. Similarly for pH, right? pH is a measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration in the solution. If we affect the concentration of hydrogens in the solution, that can affect whether the protein interacts with itself or whether it interacts with the hydrogens that are in the solution. And if the protein interacts with the hydrogens in the solution, it'll cause the protein to unfold and it'll cause it to become denatured. And so these are just some of the ways through which proteins can be denatured. Um, detergents also do the same thing. Basically anything that causes the protein to unfold will denature that protein. And this is why a high fever can be so bad for our body because proteins in the body can start to denature above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if the body temperature gets above that, it starts to denature proteins and proteins do a lot of different things in the body and therefore the cells don't function properly once the proteins become denatured. So this slide is just summarizing what we talked about for protein structure. So again, primary sequence is simply the sequence of the amino acids along this chain. It's what are those amino acids in order. Secondary structure is going to be um, folding of the protein that's dependent on hydrogen bonding among the backbone. And so again, that can either be typically alpha helices or beta pleated sheets. Tertiary structure is going to be when the protein begins to fold more and it folds because of the types of interactions found in the R groups, meaning that you could have um, ionic bonds or hydrophobic interactions or covalent bonds, etc. And then lastly, we have quaternary structure, which exists in proteins with two or more polypeptide chains that are linked together. Now, proteins don't always exist as simply amino acids linked together. Sometimes proteins are conjugated to other organic molecules. For example, you could have glycoproteins. What do you think glycoproteins have with their protein? Glyco refers to sugar. So it's sugars mixed with the protein. We could have nucleoproteins, nucleic acids with the protein. We could have lipoproteins, which are lipids with the proteins. Sometimes we have proteins that are linked with inorganic molecules, like in the case of hemoglobin, it bonds to iron, and iron is an important part of that protein functioning properly. So the last class of macromolecules that we're going to talk about will be the nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are made of the following atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those three elements you'll notice are found in all of our macromolecules, even lipids. Lipids even have a little bit of oxygen. We have nitrogen, right? And remember in lab, we've learned that bacteria use nitrogen um, because they need it as a source to make their nucleic acids as well as their proteins, and we just looked at proteins. And nucleic acids also use phosphorus. So the building blocks or the monomers of our nucleic acids are referred to as nucleotides. And nucleotides have three parts. They have a pentose, pent meaning five, it's a five, five carbon sugar, either deoxyribose or ribose sugar. If whenever you see OSE, o -S -E, you know sugar, right? Glucose, fructose, lactose, etc. OSE tells you sugar. So we have our pentose, five carbon sugar. We have a phosphate group. And we have our nitrogenous base, which is going to be our purine or our pyrimidines. And some examples of nucleic acids that you're going to see throughout the course. Um, DNA, RNA, ATP, these are all examples of nucleic acids. 
Uh, notice nucleic acids, they are acidic in nature. Um, and if it's a eukaryotic cell, nucleic acids will be found in the nucleus. Remember, prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. So, if we're looking at our pentose five carbon sugar, this is going to be a five carbon sugar, and it has this uh, shape where it's a ring, oxygen at the top, and then the carbons are numbered one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. And so if we look and compare DNA versus RNA, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acids. RNA stands for ribonucleic acids. So a difference between DNA and RNA is the type of sugar that's used in DNA versus RNA. DNA, if we look at carbon two, DNA has a hydrogen. RNA has this hydroxyl group. And so for RNA, uh, the sugar in RNA is referred to as ribose. In DNA, it's referred to as deoxyribose. Deoxy meaning it's missing an oxygen. And that's why when we look at carbon two, it lacks the oxygen, but the oxygen is found in ribose sugar. So RNA uses ribose sugar. It has the hydroxyl group at carbon two. DNA uses deoxyribose, which is lacking the oxygen at carbon two. So when we look at the nitrogenous bases, these are going to be these nitrogen-rich planar molecules. And the nitrogenous bases can be broken down into two categories. We have pyrimidines and purines. And the way I remember this is pyrimidines, longer name, smaller rings, meaning they're only one ring big. Purines has a smaller name, but bigger rings, meaning they're two rings big. And so there are three bases that are found in both DNA and RNA cytosine, adenine, and guanine. Those three bases are found in both DNA and RNA. However, a difference between DNA and RNA, DNA uses thymine, RNA instead uses uracil. So a difference between them again, DNA uses thymine, RNA uses uracil. But the other three bases they have in common. Now, the way I remember which ones are pyrimidines and which ones are purines is pyrimidines has a Y in it. Cytosine and thymine, which are both pyrimidines, have a Y in them. Adenine and guanine, no Y. Therefore, they're not pyrimidines, but instead they are purines. When we are linking nucleotides together, we get our phosphodiester linkage. And again, the way that this works is that we have this oxygen. This is a carbon one, two, three, four, five. Same thing here, one, two, three, four, five. And when we link our nucleotides together, when we link our monomers together, Again, same thing like always, we're going to use a dehydration reaction. We need to remove water in order to form that covalent bond between the nucleotides. And the way that this works is we link this 5' prime phosphate group, so here's our 5' prime phosphate, with the 3' prime hydroxyl group. And so this water molecule is going to be removed, and we get this covalent linkage which is referred to as a phosphodiester linkage. And so it's the phosphodiester linkage that's going to link these nucleotides together. And this is gonna be a covalent bond. Now, what ends up happening is, is let me again renumber these. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And so just like proteins, which end up with two distinct ends, remember proteins have an N-terminus and a C-terminus, um, 
nucleic acids also end up with two distinct ends. We have a free 5 prime end, which has the free phosphate group. Notice this phosphate group here is participating in the phosphodiester linkage. And we end up with a 3 prime end, which has the free hydroxyl group. This hydroxyl group is participating in the phosphodiester linkage. So just like proteins have dis two distinct ends, so do nucleic acids. We have a 5 prime end and a 3 prime end. Now, in terms of a difference between DNA and RNA, DNA is double-stranded. meaning two strands are linked together. RNA is single-stranded. And what that means is that for DNA, it's like a ladder where the backbone is going to be our sugar phosphate groups. And the bases are going to be the rungs of the ladder. And so what we're going to get is these nitrogenous bases will form hydrogen bonds with one another. And they will form what's called complementary base pairing. And that is that A pairs with T and G pairs with C. So we're going to get a pyrimidine, so thymine or cytosine paired with a purine, which is adenine or guanine. And so A pairs with T, G pairs, remember that because G and C look the same, so they go together. So again, if we're looking at DNA, which is double-stranded, DNA is going to exist as a double-stranded helix. Again, the backbone is going to be alternating sugar phosphate groups. The appendages are what sticks out towards the middle. That's going to be the nitrogenous base. And again, A would pair with T, G would pair with C. And when we get a, a double helix, DNA runs anti-parallel. And what that means is that this 5 prime end would loop around and the 3 prime end would be here. And this one over here, the chain on the right, that's the three prime end. So if we follow it down, this is going to be the five prime end over here. So the two strands run in opposite directions. It's not that they both run five prime and five prime going down. It's that they are mirror images. One strand runs five prime to three prime. The other strand runs three prime to five prime. And so that's what we say DNA is anti-parallel, meaning the two strands run in opposite ends. So what is the function of nucleic acids? Nucleic acids function to store and transmit hereditary information. And so what that means is that if we look at DNA, and let's say DNA has a sequence of A, G, T, A, 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 C, G, A, and it's double stranded, so that's T, G would pair with C, T is A, T, 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 G, C, T. What happens is, is DNA is responsible for storing genetic information. Now, what happens then is that DNA is going to undergo something called transcription. It's going to be transcribed to a similar language. It's going to be transcribed from DNA to RNA. Now, they're not identical, right? We've already talked about some differences between DNA and RNA. DNA is double-stranded. RNA is single-stranded. DNA um, uses thymine, RNA uses uracil. 
um, etc. The sugars are different. So DNA uses deoxyribose, RNA uses ribose sugar. But in transcription, what's going to happen is an enzyme called RNA polymerase is going to come along and it's going to read the DNA. And so let's say that this is my template strand, meaning this is the strand of DNA that gets read. The enzyme is going to read the A and on the mRNA, it's going to put a U. And on the G, it's going to read the G, it's going to put a C. T, it's going to put A. A, there's no T, so remember U, 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 G, C, U. So what we end up having, what we end up having is that we're transcribing a similar language. We're going nucleic acid to nucleic acid language. mRNA stands for messenger RNA. It's going to be the messenger. It's going to take the information out of the nucleus, if this is a eukaryotic cell, mRNA is going to exit out the nuclear pore and it's going to come along to the ribosome. All cells have ribosomes because ribosomes are responsible for the synthesis of the protein, a process that's referred to as translation. Because now we're, we're going from um, mRNA language to amino acid language. And so the way that this works now is that we're going to get our amino acid and it's going to read groups of three mRNA that we call codons. So these codons will code for a particular amino acid. For example, UUU will code for phenylalanine and UCA will give some amino acid, GCU will give another amino acid. And so in translation, we're translating. We're going from nucleic acid information, which is gonna be in the form of mRNA, and we're translating to a new language, which is gonna be amino acid language. So we're going nucleic acids to amino acids. And so notice that in this way, DNA is going to store genetic information. RNA is going to be responsible for transmission of this hereditary information. And in this way, this is how the, the cell's genetic code, its DNA, will tell the cell what proteins to make. Now, just to show you how important this sequence is, Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease, and in sickle cell anemia, it's caused by a single base pair change, meaning it's simply one nucleotide different. It's one letter different in the beta globin gene. And so we get a single base change in the DNA, which then means we get a single base change in the mRNA, because again, the mRNA comes from the DNA which also leads to a single amino acid chain change in the beta globin protein. So this disease is caused by one single letter different. So how does this work? Well, if we look at the normal beta globin sequence, valine, histidine, leucine, threonine, proline, glutamic acid, glutamic acid, in the case of sickle cell anemia, we get one single nucleotide different. One single letter in the DNA sequence is different. That one DNA sequence change leads to one amino acid change. So we go from glutamic acid at residue number six to now valine. Now you might wonder, well, so what? It's one amino acid different. How much difference can that actually make? And the answer is, if you change the R group of the amino acid, it can greatly affect the way that the protein folds. Because remember that protein structure is dependent on interactions among R groups, for example. And so in the case of valine, valine is a hydrophobic amino acid. Glutamic acid is an ionic amino acid. So you're totally changing the property of this one amino acid. You're going from something that's ionic to now something that's hydrophobic.
And as a result, it's going to change the way that the protein folds. And so instead of forming this normal beta subunit, it's going to form this mutated subunit where the protein folds different and it has this exposed hydrophobic region. Now, when we look at the structure of hemoglobin, remember I said that it's made of four subunits, two alpha subunits and two beta, two alphas and two beta. In the case of sickle cell anemia, the two beta subunits are mutated. And so overall, the protein has a different structure. And what ends up happening is, is that these hemoglobin molecules, because of this misfolding, the hemoglobin molecules tend to stick together. And so you end up with these chains of hemoglobin all stuck together. And you can imagine red blood cells being like a rubber band, right? If you have your rubber band and it's um, in its native conformation, right? It's circular in nature, etc. However, if I take that rubber band and now I put a stick in it, like a toothpick in it, right? Meaning a chain of hemoglobin all stacked together. If I take a toothpick and put it in my rubber band, my rubber band is gonna elongate and it's not going to be this nice round circle anymore. And the same idea happens with the red blood cells. So for normal red blood cells, they have this nice concave disc round shape. However, in the case of sickle cell anemia, because of that one amino acid difference, that beta globin gene uh, or beta globin protein misfolds, hemoglobin molecules stick together, we get these chains of hemoglobin, and as a result, it causes the red blood cells to take on a sickle shape. Now, all of this happens because of one single nucleotide difference. And now you might wonder, well, okay, so we have these sickle-celled red blood cells. Why does that matter? Well, it causes problems for several reasons. One is these abnormally shaped red blood cells get stuck in the tiny capillaries which is where um, gas exchange typically happens in the body. And so these capillaries are these little tiny blood vessels and these sickle cell red blood cells get stuck in those capillaries and they cause reduced blood flow to the tissue. Um, that can lead to tissue damage where this happens. Um, it can lead to a lack of oxygen in the tissue. Um, it can cause pain in the tissue where the blood clot is forming, etc. The other problem is that it greatly affects hemoglobin's ability to carry oxygen. So when hemoglobin molecules stick together, like for sickle cell anemia, hemoglobin is not very effective at picking up oxygen. It's not able to pick up as much oxygen as, say, normal hemoglobin would be. And so because of the fact that it's not as effective in picking up oxygen, your cells need oxygen in order to make ATP for energy. And so when you get reduced, um, when you get reduced oxygen to the tissues, what's going to happen is, is the cells become fatigued, right? Because they need that oxygen to make ATP. If they're not making enough ATP, they're not functioning opt optimally. And that's where the anemia part comes in. So when we say that you're anemic, right, you're not getting enough blood flow, um, your, your red blood cells are not efficient at carrying oxygen, and as a result, the patient experiences like extreme fatigue and tiredness because their cells are not making enough ATP. And so all of, these pro all of these problems happen in a patient's body when they have one single letter different in their DNA sequence. And so this DNA sequence is extremely important um, in terms of how the protein functions. So what I want you to do is to just take a minute and compare and contrast DNA. So for example, what is the pinto sugar in DNA? What is the pinto sugar in RNA? DNA, does it have a phosphate group? Yes or no. RNA, does it have a phosphate group? Yes or no. 
in terms of nitrogenous base, which bases do DNA have? Which bases do RNA have? How many strands does DNA have? How many strands does RNA have? What is the linkage between the nucleotides? So what holds nucleotides together? So what I want you to do is go ahead and pause the video, work on this, and then when you're ready, go ahead and push play to see the answers. Okay, so DNA, pinto sugar is gonna be deoxyribose. which remember means it's missing oxygen at carbon two. RNA, on the other hand, uses ribose. Ribose has oxygen at carbon two. So that's a difference between DNA and RNA. In terms of phosphate group, does DNA have it? Yes. Does RNA? Yes. Because they're both made of nucleotides, and nucleotides have a five carbon sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. So that's the same between them. They both have a phosphate group. In terms of nitrogenous base, they both have A, C, G. A, C. G, and a difference would be DNA has thymine, and RNA has is uracil. Number of strands, DNA has two, RNA has one. Linkage between nucleotides, it's called a phosphodiester linkage. And that's the same for RNA, it's a phosphodiester linkage. So question for you, which of the following nitrogenous bases is not found in an RNA molecule? So which one is not found in RNA? Is it red, adenine, yellow, guanine, green, thymine, blue, uracil? So pause your video. And when you're ready, go ahead and push play to get the answer. So if you said green thymine, you are correct. Thymine is found in DNA only, not in RNA. Adenine is found in both. Guanine is found in both. And uracil is found in RNA only. And so that concludes our video.